Hello, welcome to our time of worship today in the Shetland Methodist District for this week. We're going to begin our service today by singing of the majesty and glory of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, with Come, Let Us Sing to the One. Let us sing to the One, to the Father of Light, whose light fills the earth like the sun. Come, tell of the wonders He's done. Great is the world He has made, and the mystery is untold. It's His measureless power of old. Come, come, let us sing to our God. To our God who is able to strengthen us. It is grace beyond all we imagine, be all glory and praise, be all praise. Come, let us sing to the One, to the Saviour of life, and the fullness of God in the Son. Come, tell of the wonders He's done. Wild is the mercy of Christ, is the richness of grace, is the unending life we embrace. Come, come, let us sing to our God, to our God who is able to strengthen us in his grace. Beyond all we imagine, be all glory and praise, be all praise. Let us sing to the One, to the Spirit of life, leading us in the way of the Son. Come, tell of the wonders He's done. Strong is the Spirit within, is the boldness to speak, is the power to run when we're weak. Come, come, let us sing to our God. Let us pray. God, you are majestic, you are glorious, for you have done wonderful things in the life of this world, in bringing it to being, in your word which spoke creation into existence, your word which has sustained and guided your people over the generations, your word which in Jesus came into the flesh and showed us who you are, what you are like in a new and fresh way. Your word, which by the Spirit's prompting was spoken by your followers uh, and has been shared throughout the generations since then to us today. Your word, which comes to us in Scripture. Lord, you have done many great and wonderful things. And we pray that we would hear that word of yours speaking into our hearts today that as we gather we would know you close, know you comforting us and know you challenging us. Lord, that word of yours which has done wonderful things, may we hear it afresh, may it speak to us today and guide us as we come before you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So our first reading from God's Holy Word today comes from the book of the prophet Jonah. And this comes right near the end. Jonah's been called by God, turned away, been called back after being out in the boat and being thrown overboard and swallowed by the great fish. Calling out to God in his distress, God rescued him to send him on his task that he was called to. So Jonah went to the great city of Nineveh, modern-day Mosul, in Iraq, and proclaimed the message of God. Forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people turned their lives around. And so this is the conclusion of that, starting at Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity he'd said he would bring upon the people of Nineveh, and he did not do it. 
This was very displeasing to Jonah, and who became angry, and he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is this not what I said while I was still in my own country? This is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning. But I knew you were a gracious God, abounding in mercy, slow to anger, and full of steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, Lord, please take my life from me, for it's better to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city, and he made a booth for himself there. And he sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah's head to give him some shade to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind. And the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And Jonah said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you're concerned about the bush for which you did not labor, which you did not grow. It came up in a night and it perished in a night. Should I not be concerned about this Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right from the left, and many animals as well? Hello. It's good to be with you and to share in worship. When I started local preaching, I had the idea that I was going to be like John Wesley, and stand on street corners and have hundreds of people listening to me and being converted. Well, that hasn't happened yet. Well, we know that John Wesley was a very successful preacher and did indeed have hundreds of people listening to him and being converted. But despite his success, he was nowhere near as successful as Jonah. Jonah went and preached to the people of Nineveh in what must be the world's shortest sermon. Forty days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown, is what he said. But the people of Nineveh did listen and they repented and they trusted God from the highest in the city down to the lowest. And God heard their call and forgave them and didn't bring the destruction promised. And so Jonah is the most successful preacher in history. All 120,000 people in Nineveh were converted. And any preacher would be overjoyed if that happened to them. But not Jonah. He gets in a right sulk and he goes off angry at God. And so we have this conversation between him and God in this chapter. And Jonah is basically in a sulk because he didn't want the Ninevites to be converted and saved. They were Israel's enemy. They had in the past overrun the country and taken people away into slavery. So what he really wants for them is for God to send down thunderbolts and destroy the city. All along, when he has been called by God to go to Nineveh, he's known what is going to happen. He's, got, he's known that if the people did repent, that God wouldn't carry out the punishment. And he didn't want that at all. He's known all along about God's love, how indiscriminate and without limits it is. But that's okay up to a point. It's all right for God to forgive my friends, but certainly not my enemies. And so after this event in Nineveh, he goes off in his sulk and sits outside the city. And God sends a plant to protect him from the hot sun. 
and Jonah sits there. And then the next day, this plant that's been looking after him has a worm eating up and it's destroyed. And he gets in another sulk because the plant has died. And God says to him, why are you so upset about this plant that was here today and gone tomorrow? You didn't plant it or look after it. Why are you so upset about this plant? Can't you see that I am upset about the 120,000 lost souls in Nineveh? And God says to him, there's no limits to my love, mercy and grace. You'll just have to get used to it. And I'd love to know what Jonah said in reply. Jonah certainly shows us some of the anger that we can experience when confronted uh, with injustice in the world, but also the vast compassion of God and how those two come together. In our next hymn, uh, we sing of the love and the anger that we might face, uh, that we might recognise within God, and also the way God might call us to be his representatives, uh, to respond to things in the world. This is inspired by love and anger, disturbed by need and pain, informed of God's own bias, we ponder once again. And then there's some questions there of what we might wonder. Let us turn to our prayers of confession and offer our, our confessions to God. 
Lord, you are a gracious and merciful God. And you have mercy on us and call on us to live that out to others. For the times we have turned away from your call and gone the other way, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. the times we have sought the end of others and to see harm come to them rather than for them to experience your compassion and love. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. For the times we have failed to see the vastness of your mercy and grace and narrowed you in our own ways. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Jonah reminds us that it is God's nature to be merciful, to be gracious and to be forgiving. And to those who do repent and do say sorry and turn afresh to God, we can trust God's words and promises. And God says to us that we are forgiven. Amen. Thanks be to God. The parable of the workers in the vineyard. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About the third hour he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace, doing nothing. He told them, You also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. About the eleventh hour he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, Why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, You also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the eleventh hour, came and each received a denarius. So, when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But, he answered one of them, Friend, I am not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So, the last will be first, and the first will be last. Every time I preach on this parable, I always think it's a good job that trade unions weren't around at that time. They would have called everyone out on strike and said, we're not having this, it's unfair. We want equal pay for equal work. That's how things are supposed to be in the workplace. And probably we go along with the unions because that's what we expect in the work situation. Fairness, equal pay for equal work. Something the unions are still struggling with today. 
But thankfully, Jesus isn't talking about the world of work, but talking about the kingdom of God. He's just been finishing a discourse and saying, the first will be last and the last will be first. And then tell this parable to illustrate the point. From his various conversations with Pharisees, we might think that Jesus is talking to them. Uh, they would certainly think they were the first because they were Abraham's descendants and rigorous in keeping the law to the minutest degree. And for them, sinners and tax collectors would definitely be last. So they would understand what Jesus was saying. But Jesus is instead talking to his disciples. He's had a long conversation with them about the cost of following him. And Peter has said, and it's always Peter, isn't it? We've left everything behind and followed you. What can we expect? What's going to be our reward? What's going to, are we going to get out of this? And as Jesus tells them the parable, he's basically saying to them, don't expect that just because you've been close to me, you're going to be the favoured few. Others are going to be welcomed into the kingdom and they will receive the same as you. And I wonder what the disciples will say to that. And this story does show us how topsy-turvy God's kingdom is. And too often we expect God to continue the way that things are in the world. And in the eyes of the world, it isn't fair that those who have been first don't stay first and those who are last don't stay last. It's not fair because God's love doesn't depend on our abilities, our performance, our gifts or our talents, or even how much power and money we have. God's love is indiscriminate. Those who were chosen at the end hadn't done anything wrong. They'd just been waiting all day and had been overlooked. And they would have been overjoyed to have been chosen. Because just to earn a little amount for the little work they did could have meant the difference between feeding their family that day and going to bed hungry. And so God's love is indiscriminate and generous, flowing out to those who have plenty and those who have nothing, and all are welcomed into the kingdom of God. Sadly, I feel that the church has taken over the role of the Pharisees and the disciples thinking that his members who have been worshipping God will be first into the kingdom of God. And either that or wanting to judge who should be allowed into the kingdom, who's in and who's out. And so this parable is a warning for us even today who think that we've been chosen and have first place. And yes, this parable is offensive because it goes against all our expectations of fairness in the world. And that's the idea that Jesus wants to get over. That God isn't fair, that he gives us much more than we can ever deserve or expect. And that we are called to have a different way of viewing God and getting used to his, his way and seeing things through his eyes. And God might say to us, there's no limits to my love, mercy and grace. You'll just have to get used to it. Amen.
come to pray for people around the world and around these islands and our country with the different needs being faced today. Some images will appear on the screen to help us as we pray. And so let us do that now. Lord, as we come before you and we have the words of those scripture readings and the hymns we've heard and the reflections Elizabeth has brought for us, we we hold all those different topics before you in mind and in prayer. As we remember all those uh, in our own communities who have been uh, ploughing and sowing and reaping and cutting and baling over these last few weeks, we pray for all those engaged in crofting in Shetland. We pray that there will have been enough cut and bale to to see through the winter We pray for the harvests that are about to really get going. That what has been cared for and tended over the last few months will be sufficient. Lord, as we remember the way Jonah was called to go to Nineveh, we pray for all those engaged in mission around the world today, sharing the news of your steadfast love, of your mercy, and calling on people to turn their hearts and minds to you. Those who are especially in very difficult and challenging places around the world, we pray that you would keep them safe and give them the strength to be faithful to the calling you've placed on them. We pray especially today for the people of Iraq, where Jonah was sent to. We pray for them as they continue to live with difficulties, with uh, the events of the last decade, of different factions and conflicts taking place, particularly around Mosul. We pray for peace and stability and growth for the people there. God, as the master in the parable, offered a fair wage to each of those who came. We pray for those who are returning to work after furlough or worried about where 
money will come from. We pray that all will receive a living wage that is sufficient to enable people to work and be free of anxieties of having enough money to provide food. We pray for all those who are employers that they will be able to share the resources of the businesses or companies fairly amongst the workers. And that in all things, in the life of the church, in the life of work, in the life of schools, in the life of hospitals, we would see your kingdom come. A kingdom that touches all aspects of life. And now God, in a moment of quiet, we hold before you the individuals known to us in need of your prayer, in need of your presence, in need of your comfort today. Into your safekeeping, holy God, we hold before you all these people and places and pray that we would see your blessing and your kingdom come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. especially to Elizabeth for opening up the scriptures to us. I pray that as this time together comes to a close, you'll continue to know God's presence and God's blessing. And so let us pray. Lord, thank you for this time together. Stay near us as we go and continue to reveal your wonders to us. Amen. May the blessing of God Almighty Father, Son, and Holy Spirit remain with you and those you hold dear this day and forevermore. Amen.